Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part three of Getting to the Heart of Imaging. And let's start again with this case. 25-year-old female, atypical chest pain, cardiac CT to rule out coronary artery anomalies. Uh, 25 years old, they thought perhaps the patient had anomalous coronary artery. And if you look at these images, what do you see? Well, you look carefully, look at the patient's, what looks like the left coronary perhaps, it looks like it's coming from the pulmonary artery, and if we go to this next image, if I look at the image in motion, look at the location of that patient's coronary artery. It actually is coming off the pulmonary outflow track. Okay, and here it is again. You can see it here or here, and here it is in 3D. So now I ask you the question, what's the best diagnosis? I give you a few choices. Look at the image again and think about the choices. There's a coronary artery, but it's coming off an anomalous origin. Okay, so it's coming off not from the cusp of the, uh, of the aorta. And then I'll say, what's the specific coronary artery? And of course the answer is, it's the patient's left anterior descending coming off the pulmonary artery. That's an unusual anomaly. And again, I'll just show you the images. Look at it again so you really get a good feel. When you are reading cardiac CT, one of the most important things is to look at the origin of the vessels, look at where they end and where they travel. And this is an anomaly of origin, of course. And it goes by an eponym, which is Alcalpa. Anomalous origin of the left coronary from the pulmonary artery. It can occur in adults or children. In children, it's said that 90% experience a myocardial infarct and die within the first year of life. What happens is with LCAP in the pediatric patient, as pulmonary artery pressure drops after birth, there's decreased flow of blood to the left ventricular myocardium. This leads to congestive heart failure and mitral insufficiency secondary to myocardial infarction and patients will die within the weeks of birth without intervention. Now, in the adult patient, obviously the patient has survived. That means they need significant circulation from the right coronary to the left coronary circulation. Flow to the left coronary territory is often insufficient, and the patient may develop ventricular dysrhythmias, which can result in sudden death. When you think about the Alcapa syndrome, obviously the main finding is the left coronary from the uh, inferior lateral aspect of the main pulmonary artery, but you may see secondary findings of the right coronary and left may appear dilated and tortuous, dilated into costal collaterals may be seen, and LVH, or left ventricular hypertrophy, or dilatation may also occur. Article by Penna, it's a rare anomaly in which the LCA originates from the main pulmonary artery, and that CT is a very good technique for making the diagnosis, as is MR. And the comment I made before about coronary artery anomalies, think about origin, course, and termination. So when you think about origin, that's where the anomalous origin from the pulmonary artery comes from. Again, one of the key steps in analyzing a scan, where are the vessels? Okay, another case. Patient has chest pain, what's the best diagnosis? And I've given you a few choices. Now, of course, you want me to show you the images. So let's look at the images, and we'll just scroll through the images nicely. And here you're following down, and I'm going to tell you what is that vessel anteriorly that's coming off the pulmonary artery. And so when you start looking very, very carefully, just watch the sequences carefully. Take a look at the, all of the vessels. Also look at some of the tortuosity and the size of the patient's LAD. And again, take a look at it. Let's look a little bit more carefully. And there you see the right coronary artery coming in. Then you, you look and say, where is it? Wait a second, it's not going into the right cusp, it's going into the pulmonary artery. You can see there are a number of collaterals present, particularly near the course of the LED, and you can see that very nicely on these axial images. You could see it very nicely as we go into the 3D images. And you look at the 3D, you can see the motion related changes present as we rotate the images around. You get a beautiful look at where the coronary arteries are arising from, including 
the patient's pulmonary artery, which you can see. And again, you could look at some of these other images. And again, you see the collaterals. So when you have to ask the question, what's the best diagnosis? It's really that the right coronary is coming off the pulmonary artery. It's coming anteriorly, so it's anomalous origin of the right coronary artery. And so what you saw was the right coronary off the main pulmonary, the left main LAD circum branches of the RCA are dilated due to the patient's left to right shunt. Okay, and this goes by another eponym, which is ARCAPA. ALCAPA is more commonly said. This is very uncommon, but it is an important anomaly. When you look at the, uh, this variation, there are actually four types of anomalous origin of the coronary from the pulmonary, ALCAPA, RCAPA, both coronaries from the PA, and accessory coronary from the pulmonary artery. So that was number two. So a very, very nice example. Just some facts, age range, can present with angina, heart failure, infarction. Patients may be asymptomatic, and surgery is typically the study of choice or the therapy of choice for taking care of these patients. Now, it's a rare anomaly. You can see some of the numbers, 0.002%, but it is a very important diagnosis to make, particularly in childhood, but even in adulthood. And again, um, it's interesting, El Kappa leads to death, R Kappa seems not to. Okay, another case. HIV patient, drug abuse, chest pain, what's going on? Now this patient was a screening study because we, we screen some of the HIV patients, drug users as part of a multi-year multi uh, study. And when you look at the vessels, you see the vessels, but you kind of wonder, what's that vessel going in front of the aorta tracking from right to left? It looks like a coronary artery going to where the LAD should be. And then if you look at it in 3D, you can see there is a, a limb or branch from the right coronary that's tracking left and down over the ascending aorta. And you can see it right there as well. And when you look at the four sets of views, you very nicely can go through and scroll through the data sets and see very clearly this anomalous vessel, which is also shown on these cutaway images. And so when I ask you what the best diagnosis is, we have an extra LAD, right? So it's not, it's not just the LAD from the RCA, but there's a dual LAD, and that's in fact the correct answer. When you talk about dual LADs, there are basically four variations. The majority of cases have both type of vessels arising from the LAD, while occasionally the long course of the LAD arises from the right coronary. But just look at it again. You see the left main, you see the LAD, you see the circumflex, and then you see a vessel coming from right to left. That's a coronary artery. It was a duplicated coronary artery. Okay, very nice example. And here it is again as we scroll through the data set. Just watch how you can roam through the data and how quickly you're able to see the variation. So just a very nice example. And again, let me just give you a chart of the short uh, course and long course of the uh, dual LADs and make the point from this article that it's important to recognize uh, on CT because of inability to visualize the additional vessel, especially when the long LAD originates with the right coronary sinus, this anatomic variant may be misinterpreted for mid-LAD occlusion on the patient's coronary angiogram. So it's an important diagnosis. Another case, what about this one? You see the LAD, you see the plaque? So in the LAD proximally, there's significant plaque, about a 50% stenosis. Then you notice when you do the CTA, the patient's right coronary gives rise to the right and left coronary arteries. Just a very nice split there. And you can see another example of where the patient has dual coronary arteries. So a very important diagnosis. Okay, patient 56 male, chest pain, about to get a CTA. What's the best diagnosis? And here I show you something you need to notice at times on scans. Although we're not scanning for the cardiac chambers, you do have the cardiac chambers. So it's very important for you to look carefully at that. Many times you're gonna see things that are important, but even more times you're gonna see things that are simply artifact. 
So in this example, you see a fluid fluid level in the, in the left atrial appendage. And you say, gee, could this be thrombus? But you see the flat line, that tells you it's not thrombus. And so when I ask the question, what's the best diagnosis here? You're going to know that that linear line is a pseudothrombus. Here it is again on two views and two more views. It's simply layering out. Things that layer out with time are not going to be um, acute thrombus in the uh, atrium, which does occur in many cases, but this is going to be a pseudothrombus. And if you scan early enough in most patients, you will see a pseudothrombus. So that indeed is the answer. On the other hand, what about this case? Well, it looks like the same thing. Big atrial appendage. The bigger atrial appendages tend to have more pseudoclots. And so sure enough, there's a fluid fluid level. It's sharply marginated. A clot's not going to give you a fluid fluid level like that. Here's this 3D view from the front. We see the left atrial appendage, but the thrombus is in the back. It's kind of layering out. And depending how you look at it, you may see more or less of the thrombus. On the other hand, when you see a case like this, the thrombus in the patient's left atrial appendage, that tends to be very easy, right? Because when you look at the thrombus in the atrial appendage, you realize that it's not layering out, it's real, and oh yes, when you look at the abdomen, you saw infarcts in the patient's left kidney, this uh, clot in the patient's left main pulmonary vein. Another example here, thrombus left atrium and pulmonary emboli. So it's a very good study for looking at uh, this application. And so it's important to recognize this is a real thrombus. There's no layering. When you see a, a pseudothrombus, you are going to see layering. So that indeed is a very important diagnosis. Um, one challenge is sometimes you scan too early to be certain it's not a thrombus. This article by her made the point that they were doing two phases and then it allowed them to be certain whether or not something was a thrombus. I think one thing you can do is if you're not certain if it's a thrombus because maybe your scans are too early or the cardiac function is too poor or the appendages uh, are too, uh, too late perhaps, then simply getting a delayed scan makes life very simple. Once you do that, your accuracy approach is 100%. So again, if you're uncertain, just go back and get one more scan. And in this article, they talked about their protocol, which was basically two sets of scans about 30 seconds apart. So that kind of solved the problem. Now, sticking to the extra coronary vessels, what about this case? Chest pain, cardiac, CT, triple rule out. There's the lesion in the patient's left atrium. It's anteriorly positioned. What is that lesion? It's not a pseudoclot, it's not a fake lesion. It's real, and then if you go and you do the uh, viewing inside the, uh, the chamber, you can see very nicely the thrombus present there. Um, and again, looking at it very carefully, that's just a very nice example. So what is it? Well, when you see clot or thrombus or mass in chambers, that's what you're thinking. Is it a pseudo lesion, like I showed you the uh, atrial appendage before? But within the left atrium proper, it's either typically a tumor, be a primary malignant, or it's a clot or thrombus. And then we think about myxomas. So in this 40-year-old, I'll ask you the question, what's the best diagnosis? And the best diagnosis from location, shape, size, is a myxoma. And so atrial myxoma is the most common benign tumor of the heart. 50% of all benign cardiac tumors age about 50, so everything's about 50, can present with an incidental finding or with symptoms of cardiac obstruction or embolization. The majority occur near the fossa ovalis. 75% are in the left atrium, 25% are in the patient's right atrium. Um, we talk about cardiac masses. This article by Linda Chu spoke about they're rare, but we do pick them up. Sometimes they're the cause of the patient's symptoms. And again, the numbers are small. And cardiac tumors, in fact, are more common metastatic than primary. But primary ones do occur across the different chambers of the heart and across different areas around the heart. So you see cardiac masses, the benigns, the myxomas, lipomas, papillary epithelial fibroelastomas, hemangiomas, and the like. And the malignancies, you go from the meds to lymphoma to sarcomas. Again, looking back at that case, you see the thrombus 
or mass present. This was a myxoma, and here is just another set of images where you can see different appearances to myxoma. Again, the importance of location near the fossa ovalis can be very helpful. Occasionally, myxomas can calcify. Now, another tumor which you can see is a papillary fibroelastoma. It's a small tumor. It usually hangs off the leaflets of the uh, patient's aortic valve. And you can see the filling defect there, and you can see it here, right? You see it's coming off the cusp. It's a polypoid lesion. Very nice example. And as we look at these images, you can get a very good case. By looking at the motion, you can see the polypoid lesion there. Again, it shows you very nicely the ability for CT to look at the coronary arteries, but look also at the individual chambers. And these papillary fibroelastomas are the most common benign neoplasm of the cardiac valvular structure, second most common type of cardiac tumor, and these are typically treated with resection. One article by Ja talking about these lesions, the short pedicle papillary fronds, the most classic non-valvular origin was observed in about 16% of cases that included left and right ventricular septal and mural in the cardiac surfaces, atrial uh, endocardium, papillary muscles, cordia tendina, and intima of the right coronary osteum. So it is important to note the location of these lesions. These lesions are benign, but they can embolize, so they can be very problematic. So again, you can see when you're looking at a chest pain patient, there's so much to look at. We look at the ascending aorta, descending aorta. We're looking at the pulmonary arteries. We're looking at the pleural surfaces and process from the abdomen can leak into the chest. We're looking very carefully at the coronary arteries. We're looking at not just coronary artery stenosis, but anomalies, not very strange anomalies, but the common ones. Uh, so you want to be able to look at that. And again, it becomes very important when we look at conclusions. Evaluation of coronary arteries extends far beyond uh, the 50 to 70 percent stenosis group of patients. Analysis of the coronary arteries requires understanding of the full extent of pathology. You want to also know how you manage patients. You want to know what contrast you use. You want to know how to do the protocols. Again, coronaries are not very forgiving. You can make great diagnoses if the vessels are opacified, there's no motion, and you can bring things into play. But if you don't have those basic technical factors, indeed, it's going to be difficult. And if you really want to do well in looking at the coronary arteries, you need to be thinking not just about stenosis, but about the range of pathologies we talked about. So uh, it's a very exciting field. It's a very exciting set of images, and we hopefully you found this to be of worthwhile for you to listen to. And anyway, if not, have a great day.